Let's bring into the conversation Donna Murray-Turner, uh, who works as a safer neighbourhood chair in Croydon. I mean, Donna, absolutely devastating, isn't it? It is just heartbreaking. And this is what you've devoted yourself and your life and your energy to trying to stop. Yes, it's a very, it's a very sad day. Um, sad is such a... It's a bit like nice, isn't it? They're not really... Yeah, an in, in, inadequate words. word. I agree. There's not re yes. I mean, it's, a, it's a tragic day. It's an absolutely devastating day. It's a, it's a terribly disappointing day as well, isn't it? Because it looked as if such great progress was being made by you and by all of your valiant colleagues who've tried so hard. And, and you know, Anthony King kept saying, working tirelessly. But, my God, it's tiring to do what you do. It You're is. not tireless. You're exhausted from your efforts, all of you, to try to stop this and try to, you know, make sure that young people appreciate the value of life, make sure that they fulfil their potential, make sure that, as Anthony was saying, parents pat their kids down before they leave, make sure they're not carrying lives. You know, all the things you've devotedly done all this time. I mean, it's absolutely devastating. So, so what are your thoughts on how this could have maybe happened? Why this kind of thing? could have happened in Croydon? I can't, if I'm honest, Vanessa, you know, I always try to be honest when you and I are talking. Yes. I think that there has been a lot of tireless work. We are very fortunate in Croydon because we have a rich voluntary sector, especially mm. where young people's needs are, are taken, taken into consideration. We have culturally competent delivery mm -hmm. uh, that might not be present in other boroughs. So we have people that look like the young people that deliver those interventions and preventions and that's important in terms of sometimes the delivery and how that comes across. Yeah. I think where we have been remiss, if I might say so, and I'm sure colleagues won't mind me saying this, is a lot of the focus, both in Croydon and I think across the region nationally, when we think of knife crime, we often think of the male child. And the provision for girls in Croydon hasn't been as it should be. And we, we've known for some time through tracking that, you know, there's an emergence of young women involved, not just on the peripheral, but directly involved in criminality. And not that that has any relevance to today's incident, mm -hmm. but I think it's important to say that the two individuals were known to each other. So this is almost, you know, we're looking at this through the domestic abuse lens. So this is not the usual broad stroke flavour of youth crime or youth violence. Actually, what conversations are we delivering to young girls around positive relationships? Are we delivering to young women about how they keep themselves safe? Donna. And that's been part it, of the conversation today. Talk to me about this conversation, because you and I are having a conversation. I hope that there are lots and lots of people watching and listening to us having it right now. So let's imagine you were having that conversation with young girls in Croydon, young women. What would you say to them about this? The conversation that needs to be had, have it with me. What would you say? So I would say, you know, Vanessa, um, what has a positive relationship looked like for you? Mm -hmm. Describe to me the relationship you saw in your home when you were growing up between your mother, mm -hmm. a step-parent. What did you see in the adult relationship that you experienced as a child? Uh-huh. Well, I would, say I, had a, I, I would say I had a mum and a dad. They were married until the day my mum died. They were occasionally bickered, you know, but most of the time they were very respectful of one another. They really loved each other. They used to kiss and cuddle in front of us. We couldn't stand it. Um, they used to share one book, passing it one to another because they had so much in common. I was very lucky, wasn't I? That's what I thought was a good relationship. So based on your experience of your parents and what you saw around you when you were growing up, how would you describe what a positive relationship looks like for you? Loving, affectionate, respectful. Um, both both people working hard to kind of supplement the family income so everyone can afford to survive. Um, united in, in, in approach to children. You know, all the good stuff, that's what I would say. OK, and the, on the flip side of that would be, I hope you would agree, negative, what a negative relationship might look like. What would you, if you were to describe your worst fear since you've described a positive relationship, what would a negative relationship look like for you? A negative relationship would be the sort of relationship where one person dominates the other, one person fears the other, one person controls the other, uh, there's no proper respect, there's not kindness, consideration, there's nothing shared or mutual, you know, there's somebody taking and somebody giving, but it's only one person in only one way. I suppose that's, that's what I would say. OK, so how would you describe... So we've discussed what's positive looked like for you and you've experienced and what negative is. 
Given those two definitions, mm. describe to me the relationship you're currently in. I'm not in a relationship. My relationship's over. A very highly oh, publicised no. singleton right now. No, no, but this is what I you would say to the girls you're talking to. OK, and so they would then say, this is what my relationship is like. Either he's very nice to me and I'm nice to him and I'm happy, or it's not like that. And they would explain what's wrong with them and what's gone wrong. And it's slightly more nuanced because obviously people like myself, practitioners, we're taught to pick up the non-verbal communication right. that says often more than the than the verbal communication. So you can tell somebody might say that they're fine. Yeah. You actually look in their eyes and you can tell all of those things. And that's in the workshops that we've delivered previous. Yes. That's how we start the conversation yes. around a whole range of things, consent, appropriate relationships, how we speak to one another, respect. And I think we need to bring a bit of that back. Right. So you think that's something that you have not presumably had the time to focus on. It's not that you haven't wanted to. It's just you've been so busy with everything else. And and the funding has really gone towards previous to this. So that, so women, women, female-led interventions don't receive the same funding. And I think that has to be said. And I'm not here for the politics. I'm just telling you the truth. Yes. Women, in, female interventions don't receive the same funding because the focus often is from forums chaired by men that say, well, that's, that's the provision over there for this kind of male focused work. And actually, in a brief WhatsApp conversation with one of the deputy mayors this evening, I'm saying we need to look at that. We look at we need to look at how we fund the work because the practitioners are out there. It's not that they, they don't they're not there, but often the funding has not been commensurate with the work. And that sometimes we know is a challenge. So we need to relook at that, refocus. What can we do? To, to revamp how we interact with young women around keeping themselves safe in Croydon in London. Thank you, Donna, very much indeed. Donna Murray Turner there, and, and deepest condolences for everything that everyone in Croydon's going through today. Absolutely heartbreaking story.